you've been listening to the sounds of free radio Aquarius broadcasting on 220 meters in the medium wave band on this Christmas day 1974 and the sounds of Tim Small broadcasting all the way through from uh, 2 o'clock this morning till uh, approximately 4 o'clock and again from 9 o'clock until uh, 10 past 4 this afternoon fortunately neither of our other two disc jockeys can make it to the Aquarius studio therefore Tim Small a very shattered Tim Small in fact is signing off and Radio Aquarius is closing down now until Chris, uh, till New Year's Eve there was a general feeling that Aquarius had run its course, although no one said so in so many words. In fact, a half-hearted farewell broadcast was made on December the 8th, 1974, on the assumption that, as the next court appearance was due on the 10th, another quick transmission probably wouldn't make any difference to the outcome. A bedroom at Tim's house was fitted out with studio gear, some of it quite expensive equipment, which would have been at home in any BBC studio. A quarter-wave aerial was strung out across the main road and secured to a tree in a neighbour's garden, but the local telephone wires were very close, and once the broadcast began, it was discovered that anyone using the phone nearby could clearly hear the sound of Radio Aquarius. The transmission began with a test tone for one hour from 9 till 10, and programmes were meant to last until 3 in the afternoon, which they nearly did, but at 2.35pm, the alarm was raised by one of Frank's radios. The GPO were out and on their way, taking DF bearings as they went. DF stands for direction finding, and the traditional way of doing it is to use a map, a compass, and some kind of radio with a directional aerial. Fortunately, most of the announcements had been made, so the transmitter was switched off and bundled into Tim's car. Without this piece of transmitting equipment, the GPO would be hard-pressed to get a conviction. Off Tim drove to a field not far from the old Pars Wood site, where the equipment was carefully hidden under a bush. Fifteen minutes later, Bob, Tim and Charlie assembled on the drive of Tim's house, all equipped with clipboards and pens, ready to have some fun with the men from the ministry. It wasn't long before a car containing several shady-looking characters, all of them in their Sunday best, turned slowly onto the avenue. When they spotted the reception committee, however, the car gathered speed and went straight past, turning at the end of the road to make another pass. The car slowed as it approached, the occupants staring at the assembled Aquarius, who for once weren't running away. The game was afoot, and this time it was Gordon's best who fled, obviously realising that there was little chance of nabbing anyone for naughty radio on this occasion. Had they looked above their heads, they would have seen the wire aerial. This small victory did little to raise Aquarius' spirits. Some of the recent broadcasts had had rather a sour flavour, the four or five hours of airtime being used to taunt and insult the post office, rather than entertain listeners. However, Christmas was approaching, and farewell broadcast or not, Charlie had plans for a special using the 400 watt transmitter, first used at Wilmslow in September. Andy asked Charlie to find somewhere that would enable a decent aerial to be erected, otherwise the whole thing would have been a waste of time. However, there was a personal appearance to be made at Ashton Magistrates first, to answer charges of illegal broadcasting. The magistrate ordered the confiscation of all the equipment, some of which was found hidden under a bush at Lyme Park, as well as heavy fines. Despite this, there was a job to be done. Charlie somehow managed to borrow the key to a student's flat that Bob had found near the centre of Manchester and they made plans to get the equipment smuggled inside. The first thing Andy did was to inspect the outside of the building to see if there was any chance of erecting a good vertical aerial. However, there wasn't a chance and to make matters worse, the horizontal wire would be far too short to radiate efficiently. The transmitter was trundled through the first entrance towards the apartment door. Once inside, Andy began to wire the chassis together, while the others nipped out to get the studio equipment. The transmitter was switched on, and when the headphones started buzzing and howling, they knew they had lots of extra work to do, adding capacitors and bonding the most sensitive parts like the turntables and microphone to earth. Finally, everything was sounding good. The signal over Manchester was very strong, completely blotting out the continental stations on the frequency. However, it was too good to last. A few hours into the broadcast, one of the 813 PA valves threw in the towel. There was no noticeable drop in strength, but the modulation suffered, and the last few hours of the broadcast were quite badly distorted. 
At 10 minutes past four on Christmas Day, a tired sounding Tim Small signed off. After a short pause, Tim threw the switch and put the transmitter out of its misery. Aquarius wouldn't be back for the promised New Year celebrations. Charlie wanted the station to continue, but was nervous about further convictions, and Bob felt much the same way. In fact, Bob had suffered the most, paying the most and the largest fines. All of the staff had been making more and more excuses not to take part. The very last Aquarius broadcast was, as far as anyone can remember, in January of 1975 from an empty house in Wilmslow with a junk-built 20-watt mains power transmitter and the aerial was the usual quarter-wave inverted L. Shortly before 11, the transmitter was warmed up and dead air radiated for a few minutes before the first tape began. Everyone made themselves scarce, but someone was going to have to stay to change the cassettes and just then, Barry turned up. Barry was one of the team's long-term members, but he'd taken a backseat role for the past year or so. He was told where to find the transmitter and given the remaining tapes, and that was that. Everyone else went home safely and out of harm's way. All went smoothly until the broadcast was finished, and Barry was in the garden wondering what to do about unplugging the transmitter that was wired directly into the mains. Then, from out of nowhere, Pop Gordon's Merry Men, accompanied by the usual couple of police officers. After a brief inspection of Andy's power supply arrangements, Barry was escorted to the local Nick, and eventually charged with stealing electricity. So, there it was, the final broadcast from Radio Aquarius. Not a fitting end for the station that had made the news consistently for the last two years, and which had been such a thorn in the authorities side. Aquarius had reached the end of the line, and it was better to leave it alone than to make half-hearted attempts to revive a spent force. They'd been on the air every Sunday, with the exception of two, from mid-1973 to January 1975. It had rarely been out of the newspapers, and had made several appearances on radio and TV, and stirred up interest and excitement amongst the public. It's now almost 50 years since Aquarius appeared on the airwaves. When the dust had settled, the Aquarius team went their separate ways and got on with their everyday lives.
And as for Andy, the bearer of this amazing six-part story, well, he carried on working at the radio and TV store. In 1976, with help from friend Ian, he set up medium wave pirate Radio Lancashire, and then another called Radio Phoenix. In 1979, Bob and Andy got together again to form the low-power FM pirate Andromeda Radio, which broadcast weekly for the next three years. Andy finally got round to taking the amateur radio exam in 1984 and has since avoided any further pirate activity. 